without further ado, uh, thank you uh, to all of you who have joined the call um, thus far. Very punctual, I might say. Uh, I am delighted to uh, introduce uh, the co-founder and president of Airwallex, Lucy Liu, uh, to the call. Um, Lucy is uh, already, I think, a revered figure in the Australian startup uh, ecosystem uh, by, by way of the incredible growth that we have seen with Air Wallex over the last few years. Um, she established her industry credentials as an investment consultant with the China International Capital Corp, uh, China's first uh, joint venture investment bank. She is an incredibly successful and inspiring founder who was selected for Forbes 30 under 30 in Asia in 2017. And now she manages uh, the ongoing business operations of one of Australia's most impressive and successful fintech exports, Airwallex. Welcome, Lucy. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us uh, in in what is uh, in what wouldn't have been possible, I think, in the uh, in the pre-COVID world. Uh, delighted that you're in fact joining us tonight, uh, not from Melbourne, um, but in fact from Shanghai. Uh, so this is an exciting feature that we can now hold this, these truly uh, global events. So thanks, thanks for, for, for coming on. Um, I'm glad to hear that you've uh, obviously been safe and well. And, and what I'd like to do um, to start the call is to kind of kick off with the, the birth story of Airwallex. Um, from my understanding, you know, the, the company was founded in late 2015 uh, by you, uh, by Jack Zhang, Jacob Dai, Keylock Wong, and Max Lee, uh, we were just talking before in the in the call, and you were you were friends at university, but um, were were friends, shall we say, who were not actually attending their their lectures, which is probably how all of the best you know, all the best businesses start. And in fact, that's how the the idea developed, right? In a in a coffee shop in in Docklands, um, well, or at least that's what we were discussing. Can can you can you recall the the exact moment when you were all kind of sitting down and, and talking about um, what was this, you know, this light bulb idea for Airwallex? Can you paint that picture for us? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, like you said, in 2015, my co-founders Jack and Max started a cafe in Melbourne, Docklands. And it's actually a side business for uh, both of them because uh, Jack was working for ANZ at that time and Max was an, a professional architect. And um, while I guess they were running this business, they had to import a lot of uh, goods such as um, you know, coffee cups, labels, all sorts of things for their cafe from China. And during the process, I think they realized that you know, there was a lot of uh, interest transparency and you know, expensive for exchange rates and a lot of things that were sort of hurting their profit margin. And it, we never really thought about that before because all of us were working in the institutional banking world where you know everything is you know like calculating pips or for those people who don't know it's like 0.01 percent um whereas in the retail world the fx margin is you know four or five percent and um you know jack at that time you know thought you know there must be a better way of doing it um you know using technology to solve this problem especially for smes and um he actually discussed this idea with um, Jacob, who is, who's our CTO, um, for a couple of months. And um, around that time, I, I just finished my job at uh, CICC. So, you know, during the discussions, we felt like, you know, okay, everyone just quit their jobs and you know, we, we want to, um, you know, make this work. And I think it wasn't really a light bulb, but mo most of it, was you know just having the idea and we want to actually devote our time to it um you know we couldn't possibly do that if everyone's still having a full-time job so yeah so i guess you know that's the start of air what was the what was the moment because I'm, as i said you know 84 percent of people on the on the line considering you know uh becoming an entrepreneur in your in your footsteps what was the moment where you said I, i'm quitting my job I, I i just need to quit my job and do this well, for me, I think it was very easy because I was already unemployed. I was actually taking a break, career break. Um, for others, I think it was, um, first of all, we were able to secure some, uh, secure some funds from um, 
our friends and family and also our personal money. So at least I think for we knew that we could afford to um, you know do this uh, for for at least six to twelve months without um, external funds, and which is I guess you know why we I think everyone just took a leap of faith and you know Xi Jinping uh, Jacob Xi Jinping sorry I just always refer to him in his Chinese name. Um, was a serial entrepreneur, um, serial entrepreneur. So he already had like four or five startups. Some of them worked well in that he sold, some didn't work well. And at that time, that particular one was uh, was failing pretty heavily. So um, yeah, he actually just, you know, wrapped that up and decided to join us. Amazing. So, so it, Basically, the business started out as a way uh, to for, for cheaper and faster ways to make you know cross border payments, right? Um, with that as the the basic you know the kernel the the basic idea, um, how how did you kind of go about um, understanding whether this was really the right idea and whether it was something worth pursuing? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the first product we had was. Uh, kind of like an invoicing platform where um, the supplier can send an invoice cross border to someone on, uh, uh, like in another country and then um, to pay for the invoice. And I think um, at that time we didn't really have very comprehensive understanding of compliance of you know how, how the product would actually work. So our, our first product actually didn't work. <laughs> but um, I think while we were talking to different potential clients and also um, at that time we were also raising our Series A, um, so from Tencent and from other um, investors, we actually found more opportunities in the enterprise space. Um, even though, you know, we started targeting the SMEs to start with. And um, we, I think, at that time, the team was quite small, um, which allowed us actually to shift our um, direction and priorities pretty quickly. Um, so we actually started developing APIs based on our initial sort of international payments product. And we were able to get pretty good traction from that. And from there on, we actually revisited our SME offering. Um, so now we actually have uh, solutions and products for business of all sizes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's a really interesting point, you know, that you say that, you know, the, the first product didn't work. And I'm sure that there are many people on the call who have been in precisely that situation that, you know, you, you launch something and it, and it, and it, it just, uh, for, it, for some reason, it doesn't work. I mean, how do, how do you think you know when you've found uh, a problem that's worth solving? I mean, because, you know, we, we always tell entrepreneurs that, you know, what they're looking for is, they need to find something where, where there's demand. You're looking for demand. You know, is it a painful problem? Is it a popular problem? Is it a frequent problem? Is it urgent, growing, unavoidable? All of these are ways of describing demand. How did you know that that was something that you'd found? Was it just through this experience that Jack had had or, or did you start seeing market signals to tell you? Yeah, so I think the initial trend was, you know, obvious. The reason that we started with invoicing was because it was actually for offline businesses, you know, trying to transact globally. But actually, you know, while we were um, developing the products, we realized that a lot of businesses are born online these days. So whether it's, you know, a Shopify e-commerce website or, you know, it's an online educational firm or, you know, freelancing firm. So actually, I think while we, um, while we were sort of, uh, in the early days of air wallets, we quickly realized that you know the world is becoming more digitized, and it's also becoming more uh, globalized. So, in the sense that you know, if you have access to the internet, you can possibly have the whole world as your potential customers. Um, and then we, you know, looked at our product and thought, you know, do we have the right infrastructure in place, or are we just merely building an application? And um, the answer is obviously that you know the, the infrastructure also needs some you know 
uh, innovation and it also needs some disruption. So we actually spent maybe around nearly two years building the foundation of uh, Airworks backend, which is why I think a lot of people didn't really even know what we do until we were a unicorn because um, a lot of it was on the backend. But I think in the long run, having that infrastructure in place actually allowed us to scale more quickly. And we were able to quickly roll out our new products and, and you know anything that could uh, meet the demand of the market. Yeah, it's. I think it, it, it's an amazing. It's an amazing story that, and, and it, I, I think it demonstrates the uh, how effective you have all been as leaders. That you know you could build uh, investor confidence and team uh, team commitment to go and build that infrastructure, and then obviously become one of the fastest uh, ever unicorns. It's, uh, it, it is a truly remarkable, um, truly remarkable story. I just want to go out to the, I do want to go out to the crowd now um, and, and just get a poll of those of you who are on the, who, who are on the call. Um, how many of you think that you might have spotted a viable business opportunity, uh, you know, like the Airwallex founders did back in 2015? Very interesting to, to see what comes out here. We give you. We we'll, we'll give everybody another five, four, three, two, one. Oh yes, I like the beep. That was awesome. Oh, wow! Fully fifty nine people on the call. Well, I it, it's it's uh that's that's very that's that's very impressive. I I can just say that once again, if there's that many of you out there, the apply link is in the <laughs> is in the call. Um, I think that um. And, and, and it would be interesting to know of, of those of you who'd, who'd actually put this out there, right? The, the, the biggest issue or one of the biggest issues preventing people from starting companies is, you know, the attitude. And, and you know, Lucy, you said that for you, it was kind of an, an, a natural thing because your, your role at CICC had come to, to an end. But I think that often people, the reason that they don't want to do it is because they don't have, you know, uh, a, you know a good idea. Our view is, you know, we're living in this age of, Kind of this age of opportunity, right? And that um, that really there are ideas everywhere and opportunities everywhere being created by digitization by uh, the, the the internet. Um, it, when before before the four of you had sat down in the in the in the coffee store thinking about um, thinking about air wallets, had it been in, on your mind to go and become an entrepreneur anyway, or or, or was this the thing that really dragged you into it? Um, so I think from my perspective, I was actually, um, you know, I, I think I wanted to be an entrepreneur um, without, you know, going into details what that word actually means to anyone. Um, so I wanted to start something of my own because, you know, my previous role, it was, um, it, it was a, you know, as a job, it was a very good, like, employment, but, um, you know, I could potentially see what my career would look like if I stayed there for another five or 10 years. And um, I think that for me is not something that's very exciting or challenging. And I think similarly for a lot of people who joined um, Airwall is from a, a bigger institution, that's how they felt. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it really depends on, you know, everyone's situation. But for me, you know, it, it was a no brainer. I mean, I wanted to be an uh, entre uh, entrepreneur and I want to build something of my own and um, whatever, you know, that success may look like down the track. But, you know, I, I think at least um, at that point in time, you know, five years ago, that was what was on my mind, which is why I took the career break to start with. Um, yeah, so it was actually a very interesting opportunity I think because the others were all you know on the technical side and I was on the business side so I think you know in that sense it's actually a very complementary um, partnership that we had. So you so I mean I think this is you know a really interesting point you had already been cultural you'd already been thinking I, you know hey I, I, I want to become an entrepreneur uh, and 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 even to the point of you know considering taking a career break to to make it to make it possible, had had you or had you engaged in a process to start thinking about you know 
had had you not become friends with with Jack and the others, had you already been thinking running a process of well, what ideas could I do? Um, what are what are the possibilities in front of me? Yeah, sure. I think you know, um, um, at, because I was an investment consultant, so naturally I would think uh, think about things that are aligned in online, um, you know, uh, industries like you know just pure finance or investment or you know. Um, things like that but uh, without having the technical knowledge a lot of times you know it's very hard for a non-tech person to think about tech ideas if that makes sense um, which is why you know a lot of people actually talk uh, when, when I talk to them they're like oh how do you find a tech uh, co-founder because it's, it's always tech co-founders looking for business people and business people looking for tech co-founders um, yes yeah, so I think it definitely was uh, yeah. I had like all sorts of weird ideas at that time. I can't really recall all of them, but um, I think what made me commit to um, commit to Airwallex was having you know the technical support from my um, other founders, and also I think you know um, fintech, you know it's finance, it's technologies, and it's not too um, foreign to me. So I think. Mm. It's something that I can still understand, and um, especially on the FX trading and those things. I like I, from the business side, I still understand it, and from the application and the user case, I still understand it. Mm. So it's not something that's completely new to me. Um, however, you know, the tech side is definitely something that's different. Yeah, I think I think this is one of the hard things coming from a commercial background. And you know, most most people when they're coming in, are, you know, are often coming from that. A, either a domain background or a commercial background and that there's this kind of concern of like am I going to be able to find a technical co-founder and and so often we have this situation where people say hey I, I culturally really want to become an entrepreneur but I, I can't spot a business and so we've really thought a lot about this and the kind of ways that you can spot ideas you know like are you are you looking in white space are you finding a, a genuine invention and doing something entirely new which i think is what makes air wallet so valuable is this infrastructure is really doing something new and novel um but you know there are easier things out there and, and typically you know it's can i replicate or resuscitate another business idea or can i create the picks and shovels of a, a of a of a of a macro trend that's uh, that's occurring or can i tinker with something and apply it in a different way to to a new industry and these are the, it's, I think these are the, the ingredients to going in and getting started. But the next question that people have, and this is um, what I'm interested to hear in, 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 in your case, uh, you all knew that there was this opportunity for cross-border transactions. What, when you looked around the table at each other, how did you know or what gave you the confidence that you were the right team to go and put it into place to implement it? Um, I think in any like partnership, the first thing is always trust. You trust your co-founders and, and I think uh, in terms of expertise, you know, we had Jack on the, um, I guess, FX side, you know, we had, um, Jacob on the tech side and I brought to the table, um, experience in investment, you know, raising funds and, you know, anything that's not coding. Um, so I think, um, as a starting team, we were pretty, I think we were already a pretty good size. I mean, I always admire people who start a business by themselves because, you know, you, you can't possibly have every skill set, you know, on a table um, as a, you know, single uh, founder. Um, so I think, you know, as a team, um, we also had our personal network to tap into. So, you know, Keylog, um, came on board together um, as with the founding team and he used to work with Jack um, in NAV. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, so I think in, in terms of resources and skill sets, we, we were in a pretty good uh, position back then. And obviously over time, you know, we had to hire more, um, you know, senior executives, we had to hire more like core um, management team, but, um, you know, what hasn't changed is, I guess, the, the, the trust that the co-founders had for each other. 
and our ability to adapt and learn new things um, was pretty amazing. I mean, like, I think every year our strategy changed a little bit because there was something new in the market and we discovered something that was worth, um, you know, pursuing it as an opportunity. Um, and our strategy is very comprehensive now compared to what it used to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh... That, that just, just gets thicker and thicker. Like <laughs> No um, <laughs> I, 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 I love that. Yeah, it's always, it, it always seems so simple at the beginning and then you're like, oh no, we need to add this, we need to do this. Yeah. What, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm intrigued by your comment about trust because I think it is a really important one and uh, I, I think actually you, you see in so many companies, uh, you know, where you have that, that founder breakups, it's, it's because they probably haven't really prepared for what they're actually going to have to go through, which is a very long, um, tough journey together. Yeah. Um, how describe maybe some of the conversations that you had between each other to really, to give you self, yourself that sense of trust. Was it just because they were the other three people who weren't attending lectures and you thought, oh, they must be good people if they're not attending lecture or was there, was there more to it? Um, so I think uh, Jack and Max already did a few um, projects together. Um, so they knew each other's personality, even though they had a lot of fights in the early days, you know, they were still, you know, come to some kind of, um, you know, resolution to any, any ideas um, any, or any conflicts that they had. And um, just knowing each other for a really long time and knowing the other person's personality is very important. So um, Jacob and Max knew each other since high school and uh, Jack and Max and you know, all, all, all of them like were friends for a really, really long time. And, but you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because you know, Sometimes I give the um, example of people in a, in a dating and in a relationship, they don't really know about each other until they start living with each other. <laughs> it's like friends don't really know about each other until you start working together as well, because um, it, it's just a completely different relationship. But, um, you know, over the past four, four, four or five years, we really, because we spend so much time with each other and looking at how we make decisions and how we, you know, grow as the you know, as the company grow, um, I think, you know, the trust is just, it just has, you know, developed over time as well, because without even, you know, talking too much to each other, we still knew um, what, what, what um, sort of, what's the best business decision. And also, um, another thing is probably not taking things too personally. I mean, we're still very good friends outside of work. But um, at the end of the day, business is business. And, you know, we all um, want what is the best for our wallets. And I think that's where the trust comes from as well. Um, okay, so you all sit, so here we are, we, we're in Docklands. We've decided, hey, we've got an idea. There's some demand. We've got a team. We trust each other. Uh, and then you say, okay, let's, let's now start to, let's get to work. Um, what, what did that look like immediately? Like, you know, how did you, how do you go from here's our idea to, okay, now this is a, now this is a business. What were those first few steps for the team? Um, so I guess the first thing is obviously doing like getting all the, comp we, we, you know, have the company set up, you know, rent an office somewhere, even though it's like tiny, <laughs> um, you know, get all the, all the equipments ready and um, think about, I guess, uh, I saw such a long time ago. <laughs> um, I think we pretty early on, we, need, we knew that we had to go into fundraising mode, um, even though we had, the, you know, the stash of cash for friends and family. Um, because one is having a VC, um, you know, it's a lot of times they also force you to look at, you know, how to be a proper business because even our pre A investor told us that you need to set up um, employee uh, ESOP, which is employment stock option plan. You need to have a proper company structure. Um, you need to uh, have all these things in place, you know, legal due diligence, finance due diligence, 
strategy, even, even though we were like only three months old back then. So I think pretty early on, um, we had a, a structure that was um, in a way scalable. So even though one day, you know, we, we, are now, we now have like 10, 11, 11 companies around the world, um, it still operates as the, uh, the first original structure that we had. Um, but I think we wouldn't have done that if we didn't fundraise so early on. Um, pretty clueless about how to set up a proper, you know, VC-backed company. Um, there's, a, there's, there's actually, a, and I'm going to just jump to it now, you know, there's some, there's some questions in the, in the Q&A actually asking about this and there's, there's a couple um, so I'll, I'll kind of address, address them generally people saying hey you know if I don't know if I don't know wealthy people or if I don't have a, a big network mm -hmm. like what are some steps that I can take to build that network and to understand whether or not I'm sitting on a, an idea that might be investable for, for VC um, so I think there are a lot of like very early stage VCs these days. I mean, at least a lot more than when Air Wallets first started um, in Australia, I think. Um, we had to raise money from China because the VCs in Australia was, the, the industry was just starting. <laughs> so, um, so I think there's actually very good support. And one of the things that we benefited from was actually part participating um, in corporate uh, not incubators, but like they were programs that um, were set up to help startups get on their feet. It's, it's quite similar to, you know, the um, um, services and, you know, the th opportunities that, you know, Anto and all of other incubators provide. So the one we went into was MasterCard Start Path, and it actually gave us access to um, the MasterCard um, innovation team, innovation labs, and we were able to um, learn a lot on the product and infrastructure. Not so much on the founding, even though we took some money from MasterCard, but I think the main thing for us at that time was really knowing how um, our, uh, whether our product was, uh, uh, there is a good product market fit, because obviously MasterCard conducts a lot of research. So I think looking at how bigger corporates um, target the market is actually quite important as a startup. Um, you know, also, you know, looking at how you can do it differently or better, right? Because you're smaller and you're more like you're nimble and you're able to um, get things done pretty quickly. Mm. Um, another thing is it's investable idea. I think it's also think from the perspective of the investors. Um, you know, what they are looking for is quite simple. They look for return, right? So whether your business can be something that generates return is the most simple way about thinking it. So um, sometimes I do run into founders where they, they think the market is very, very big and they think they're going to take 20, 30 market sh uh, percent of the market share, which is... <laughs> In a way, I think, you know, you, you'd rather have a really, really giant pie and you only own a piece of it than a really, really small cupcake and then you take the whole cupcake. So, um, yeah, so I think whatever idea you have, it has to be able to evolve into something a lot bigger um, in, in order um, for it to be investable. And, yeah, and I, I think, you know, Industry is also something that's very, very important because all of the uh, VCs that we talked to were investing in fintech specifically. So if you talk to someone who invests in meditech about fintech, obviously they're not interested. So finding the right, um, I guess, lead investor and and then the, the right person to talk to um, is, you know, very, very important. And yeah, just even those, even if it's just sending VPs out to them could work. I mean, I know for a fact that some of my VC friends look at 500 more or more companies every year. So they're actually um, out there actively looking for startups to invest into. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, this, this, this kind of brings us to a, a, like an interesting point because uh, and, and I'm, I'm certain that this was not the case for you, but 
potentially it's one of the things that you managed to to develop as you were working in the uh, MasterCard incubator, for example. You know, one of the things that we commonly hear when people are trying to come uh, up with businesses with us is is what we describe as a Trojan horse mentality, which is where um, they talk about what they're going to do when the business is fully formed, how exciting it is once, what, what the business will look like once it's already established its market market position and not about, well, what is this one ingenious thing that you are going to do that actually gets you through the gate? Uh, uh, and, 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 and this is, um, I think what is the part that gets initial investors excited is when you've discovered that one tiny innovation that suddenly opens the market and makes the, the broader aspiration of the business believable. What, what, what was that, you know, what was that for you? What was the thing that, that when you had those in, in initial investment conversations, people said, okay, I'm like, this is really serious. We, they, these people know about something new. Yeah, so I think for us, it's obviously it's not the application layer, right? I mean, if you look at it, it's just another way of doing remittance or, you know, it's it's some amplified version of um, any remittance tool or what, even Western Union. So it's actually building our own uh, payment network. Mm. And we went extensively into how we do our FX pricing, you know, um, how we discover the best FX price and pass it through to our customers. So there was a lot of diagrams and and very complicated um, flow charts to you know actually um, in a way educate the investors about what exactly we're doing. So I think you're exactly right. You know, it's not about what you do when your business is fully formed is it is it's how you get there and demonstrating that you have the right knowledge and you have the right team to do it mm -hmm. and investors can't possibly know everything that is happening in the world and if they know exactly what you're talking about on the product and tech side then probably it's not that innovative to start with um, so we actually spent many hours uh, going through the back end and and doing demos and doing a lot of the um, talking about how we target, for example, one currency and how we replicate that in different markets. And you know, they will always come back and say, oh, can you, can you actually describe how that works? Or you know, to make sure that you actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> and I think, uh, yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's nice to have a you know, uh, chart that goes like that, uh, you know, exponentially for all your growth. But um, the details is actually what makes it different. And, you know, it, I think, you know, showing the pipeline, showing, you know, you know exactly what you're talking about um, is probably my suggestion to people who want to, you know, win over their conversations with investors. I, I, I have, I really, I really love this point, actually. Uh, and I, and I, I think it sounds, it sounds really simple, but, uh, I, I think it is it, it defines great companies, which is that you know if if everybody can very quickly understand what it is you're doing and that there is you know there is nothing novel or nothing innovative about it, your chances really of being you know a global tech company are slim, right? And unless you can develop that, uh, you know you're going to struggle. I I I I think that that's a a really useful test for anybody out there who is thinking about building their business. You know, I, I, you know, so often I feel like businesses are generated because people are, you know, have just, have just received their, their latest delivery of pizza and they find the customer experience not particularly pleasant on the delivery. And they're like, let's build a logistics network because that sucked as a customer experience and the likelihood that they know enough and they can do something innovative is just very, very low. Right. And, and so this, this idea of, are you able to tell investors something different about uh, about a new industry is, uh, is 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 really really important? You've obviously also been able to do that now for five years in a row, and leading up to this the unbelievable news. Congratulations over the over the last couple of weeks of uh, a two hundred and fifty million dollar capital raise. You know, uh, a, a huge clap. That is really incredibly impressive. I think it is one of the biggest 
uh, by an Australian startup on record, right? Like, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. And you did it even despite uh, the COVID pandemic, which is all the more in, uh, incredible. Can you, can you tell us what this was, um, was like? What, what, firstly, what it was like raising money during this period and how it affected your team and how, how if, if at all, I mean, obviously it hasn't mattered too much, but how, if at all, it's, it changed your, your thinking, your strategy, the way that you were, that you were considering your business options? Yeah, so um, we actually kicked off the process late last year um, yeah. before the COVID-19 happened. So it, I think a lot of the main conversations and we were able to secure a lead investor in January. So a lot of the conversations already happened. And it, it, um, the rest was just having co-investors and actually the legal and the finance due diligence done. So I think for us, we were quite lucky. I mean, we were very worried that the investors will give us the money <laughs> during like February and March because um, until it hits our bank account, it's not there, right? Um, but I think the logic is that even during this period of time, you know, investors are they're probably more cautious um, around their decisions. So they probably wouldn't invest in too many new businesses. Um, but given that we're in Series D and we have existing investors uh, returning to support us, um, it happened quite smoothly for us, luckily. Um, and I think by now it's more mainly around metrics. It's, it's around like the numbers, the economics you know, and the finance side as well. I mean, the new products and, you know, things that we're doing are still quite important, but you know, it's about how much revenue you can generate from that new product yeah. that matters. Um, so it's, I think it's a little bit different to when we were raising funds as a series A or a series B company. Yeah. That that's actually that's great because we had a we had a question uh, question from uh, from one of our viewers Yasmin uh, earlier and she submitted a question and said look um, can you can you maybe tell us the difference or uh, the difference between raising a, a crazy round like a quarter of a billion dollars um, mm -hmm. and the difference between that and 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 how you raise around from high net worth individuals angels early stage venture funds. How, what's the difference in conversation, the difference in, in approach? Um, how would you describe the difference between those two? Um, so I think in the early days, I mean, you would still present some numbers, but they're very likely to be very inaccurate. Um, and I think it's more about uh, whether the business is viable, you know, the idea can scale, it's about whether you can you know, have the right team in place so it's a lot of it is around what it could be, but um, by the time you know where Series B, you have to first of all have a track record. So you actually have to demonstrate it that you you know historically what you have done and what achievements you have, and then um, you know for any upcoming, like I said, you know it's very metric focused and it's very much about you know uh, <laughs> numbers. So we actually have like a, a, you know all sorts of Excel sheets and you know a lot of the it's around you know um, showing that thanks to Uber you know everything is about unique economics now so how much um, you know like how much uh, planning you have done and you know in terms of new products you know what, what sort of um, additional income stream is going to add to your business and um, it's, all, it's all sorts of analysis that we did and it's in a way, a lot more logical as well. Um, it's about the percentage growth. It's about, you know, uh, the share price is a direct, um, you know, conversion from whatever money you make. Um, yeah, but obviously it's still about the, um, you know, percentage growth you're able to achieve, you know, and then you converted that using mathematical models. So I think um, in a way it's, it's more like a business decision compared to when in the early days, it's more about relationships. You know, it's about, you know, how well you know the person and, you know, whether they're able to support you and, you know, have, again, trust in you for you to deliver. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that our invest, angel investor actually said to me is, you know, 
Android investment is a very high risk job because you know they actually absolutely ask for expect no return most of the time um, and they're there to help you and you know I think in, in that sense I mean obviously by the time he told me this is already serious baby so he made some return on his investment but he said you know for most of the time they actually don't expect anything whereas you know your serious D investor definitely expect a lot <laughs> From you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I, it, 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 and, and I think what that, you know, that shows or de- what that demonstrates is that, you know, the earlier stage, it is about building relationships. It's about building trust, uh, it, it, the, the trust of investors that you are going to be able to deliver on, 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 on the aspirations and the forecasts of the business, right? It's a, it's a very different set of considerations than, than later stage, later series uh, investments. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested, you know, one of, one of the things that's kind of come out recently is this, you know, in the, in the, light, of, in the light of COVID is, um, you know, some stats suggesting that, um, that, that VC investment in Australia, at least for the March quarter, you know, didn't, didn't it was in fact roughly equal with what it, what it had been in the, in the year before. And I, and I think that that's probably because the vast majority of those deals predate uh, yeah. actually COVID hitting. Um, mm. I, I'm interested to know though, you, you've obviously just done this incredible round and do you, do you have a sense of, do you have a sense of concern or optimism? What are you thinking about? What is, what is the next 12 to 18 months look like for you or is the view in Airwallex now that you have a, a war chest to really go out now and, and build a global company? Yeah, so I think um, most, the majority of our strategy is still the same, you know, in terms of international expansion and our new um, offices, licenses, product launches, um, because most of our products are, you know, online. So it, it's not really being affected by, um, COVID and you know people staying home. So compared to an offline business, it might be um, very very different. Um, but I think looking at us, you know, our portfolio of clients actually is from all sorts of industries. In terms of e-commerce, they definitely um, experience a lot of challenges, mainly on the supply chain side. So it's not really that you know they don't have any business online; it's they don't have any stock to sell. So in, uh, for that part, you know, obviously we, we deprioritize a lot of our um, e-commerce offerings because it will take them some time to recover. And, um, but obviously on the, you know, online on education, gaming, um, you know, digital side, we see a lot of uh, increase in their activities. So some of our product features and, um, you know, uh, I guess, resources have been diverted to that industry um, in particular. Mm. So but I think, I do think, you know, um, the, there will be um, some challenges around how the general economy recovers from COVID. Yeah. But um, in that sense, it actually forced a lot of offline businesses to operate online as well. So, um, you know, banks are closed. <laughs> but we are not. So, um, yeah, so we actually had a lot of inquiries, um, inquiries from traditional businesses around, you know, how they can shift their payments from offline to online. So it's actually been quite interesting for us. Yeah, that, that, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I, like, I think obviously no, nobody, nobody really knows, but um, within, that, within that context, do you have a view of like, um, you know, obviously the fastest, I think fastest ever unicorn in Australia, you kind of shattered all of these records. Like what's the, what's the next big thing, the milestone that is going to get, is the thing that you now are personally or the business is targeting that is going to get you really excited that you see is the, 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 the main goal of the business. So I think we've been very APEC focused for the last four years. I mean, we're trying to enter into the EU, um, European US markets, which is very competitive. And it's actually, actually the US market is very domestic in a sense, because it's big enough um, for any domestic company to succeed without, you know, expanding overseas. Um, so I think the, 
what the next big win for us is actually to expand outside of APAC. Mm. Um, I mean, Jack was planning on <laughs> moving to the US for half a year, but that is not <laughs> happening for, 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 for a while. Um, so, but I think a lot of things are still happening. It's just slower. Um, but it obviously it's a very different market, but we are very um, confident about it because I think Asia, in a sense, that is very, it's already very difficult. Um, Europe, I think the main challenge is on the marketing and on the business side. It's not really on the infrastructure side. Mm. So um, it will be interesting to see how we compete against some of the local players in those markets. Because in terms of offerings, we do have very you know strong presence in APAC. So if any businesses are looking to expand outside of Europe and US, we are a very good option. Um, we have more coverage, and we are you know. Um, but obviously, to compete in those markets with any domestic players is going to be very very hard. Um, yeah. Well, it's good. It, it, it's, it's good uh, for those of us who are at the point of uh, business formation to know that it remains tough even once you're a multiple unicorn. That's, uh, that's perhaps not so comforting for some, but for others <laughs> to know that it's kind of equally difficult at all stages of the... Of well, if it's difficult, it means there are opportunities, right? It's yeah. the same as, you know, um, pitching for investors. It's, it's just, if it's hard, it means if it's done... It's, 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 um, it's a good opportunity. That's true. So look, I, I, I want to get us, we've had a, a huge number of uh, Q&A come in and, and, and a lot of it focused really on, on, the, on the early days of Airwallex and how you yeah. built the business. So I, I, but I do want to summarize because I think you had some, uh, some really amazing messages in there that are, that are often overlooked, um, but, but very definitive, particularly in the early days. Um, you know, the first kind of comment that I really liked was this idea of, you know, looking for uh, niche areas, whether it's of automation or innovation that you know a lot about and where you are even teaching investors, because that's when you know that you're actually doing something that is distinctive and, and, and obviously distinctive often uh, means value. Um, I think this, the second thing that we talked about uh, and it was part of the birth story of Airwallex is, you know, that you that the that Jack particularly had seen this demand in his own experience of running the running the cafe, the demand for the thing that you wanted to go and build, and then uh, finally, what I what I really took out of your the earlier conversation is the 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 amount of weight that all of you placed on the trust factor between you as a team, um, and I think that those are three like in really important ingredients in the, in the creation of any business at the earliest stage. Is there anything else that you kind of add to those kind of three overarching comments that you've made? Mm, I think maybe one more is, is still around the team, right? I think, you know, people is what makes the business and as, you know, as, you know, we're like 400 team people now. We still do a lot of hiring ourselves. Um, and I think knowing how you can hire the best and learn to fire <laughs> people is also quite interesting. I mean, as founders, I think towards the, you know, especially towards the later stages, it's placing the right people in the right positions that really um, makes a lot of difference to the success of the business. Excellent. Well, with that, I'm going to move, I'm going to move it then to, to a few of our Q and A's and it's, it's, it's really interesting. They, they, they're kind of, uh, there's some really big themes. So I'm going to try and uh, group people's questions in, in, in some of the themes. And uh, let's start with the, the one that's obviously on everybody's mind at the moment, particularly with COVID is raising money. Um, yeah. There's, there's a couple of questions around raising money that are interesting, right? The first is, um, if I don't have a network, how do I build one? And then the second thing is, when do I know how to raise money? Should I be going out and trying to raise money immediately? Or do I spend some of my own money to, to create a little bit of something before I raise? How, how does an entrepreneur know when, when to go to market and, and who to speak to? 
Yeah, so I think one is on when. I think it really depends on the business. For us, we went to the market so early because we knew we needed a lot of money <laughs> to to um, build the foundation of what we were um, doing. And I think particularly around the you know uh, R and D cost and you know hiring people. I mean, the founders didn't take any salary for a really long time, but obviously we have to pay others. Um, I mean, we can't expect everyone to take sweat equity and work because, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, a lot of people do take a considerable salary cut to join us, um, especially early in the early days. But regardless, you still have to pay for um, the yeah. people. Yeah. So I think that's why, because given the size of the team that we needed at that time, we, uh, we went to the market pretty early on. And it was also because I think um, if you don't know anyone, it doesn't hurt to ask. I mean, surely if someone knows something about the VC world or, you know, um, or even um, do your own research around who are the main players in the market and what they typically invest in, you know, looking at their track record, what they invested in before, is it something related to the industry that you, um, you are in right now? And just reach out if, you know, if, if you don't know them directly, because um, there are a lot of meetups, there are a lot of events that are run by um, investors. And um yeah i think we even for us we did a lot of research because we don't have the time to talk to every single investor um and we particularly look for ones that can support our growth um so companies that uh vc that invested globally so they know about you know not only the domestic market but also about the international market and um yeah so i think you know finding the right investor now sort of um, narrow it down to a group and then, I mean, their contacts are not on LinkedIn, on the website. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask for an introduction or just talk to them directly. Agreed. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we, this is a, a thing that obviously we deal with very frequently and, and, and I'd add a couple of things to that. I think first is that, yeah, you need to, you need to be out uh, and, and networking. And that's something that you, even if you don't have a big network, you can do that as, as you know, as Lucy said, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of places, uh, or at least there were before COVID to go and to go and meet people, to meet angels. And you should, uh, you need to make use of that. I think the thing that is, uh, the thing that most people don't realize is that any experienced investor is in the market in order to invest money. And so you can have a straightforward conversation to ask them, Hey, are you interested to invest? What sorts of deals do you invest in? What sort of check sizes do you normally invest? When was the last time you invested? These are all really important questions. And if an investor doesn't really want to give you that information, they're probably not that serious as an investor because most yeah. people are out there to deploy capital, right? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think a lot of people think investors are scary people <laughs> and they actually don't want to invest. But actually a lot of times, all of my VC friends are short of good projects to invest in. Um, they're actually very actively looking for new opportunities and there's a competition between VCs as well. So, you know, like uh, it's, it's, it's a competitive market for them to always find new things to invest in. So yeah, it doesn't, you know, you can just very upfront ask the questions that they just said and um, quickly find out whether they are the right type of investors to pitch awesome i um we we, we had it we've, i've got two uh two two other questions one uh one of which is from uh from george which is um i think very relevant in the case of air wallets right and uh he asks you know how important is it for a startup uh for how important is a startup's location to capitalize on a good idea you know should it should an entrepreneur consider moving base to a, or moving moving their home to a to another ecosystem um to improve their chance or um do you think that it, it, it really ultimately is down to the unit the the the, the team um uh, that, that that builds the company yeah so i think location is definitely very important because it's directly linked to the talent pool that you have um we uh, 
take Air Watson as an example, the, Air, um, the founders now spend only a quarter of our times in Melbourne. Um, one is because we have a very senior management, like um, group of leaders in Melbourne. Two is because we, uh, in terms of the talent pool, um, it's, <laughs> let's just say we, we've interviewed a lot of people in the, in the market and we need uh, another, you know, um, network to tap into. But in saying that, we spent so much time in Melbourne is also because our personal network is in Melbourne and we are able to attract talent directly from our, you know, um, ex-colleagues, friends, university friends. So I think it's one to look at where your market is, uh, but two is also to look at where your stress is. Because if you're moving to a completely new um, location you're gonna need time to build your own network mm. and relationships and if you don't have those in place it's, it's very hard so for example a lot of people will move to shenzhen or beijing in china if they are starting a new um, fintech business or beijing in particular because that's the where the regulator is but actually we um chose shanghai uh one is because we know more people here and two um you know, we actually, I actually, have, oops, sorry. I actually have a home here. So I think it's, it's also to look into um, how well you know that location as well as what that location can actually bring um, for you. Um, so you don't want to be in a position where you're left with, you know, you're, you're all by yourself and you, just because there's an ecosystem doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it's. That you can tap it. That you can tap into it directly. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think, I think that's, I, th I think that's very wise advice. I, I think there is a really big trade off, right? I mean, it's, uh, you need to have a, I mean, it's kind of what we've been talking about with fundraising. A lot of early stage fundraising is, is about building networks. And if you displace yourself to another market, that's the, that's the trade off is that you, you don't have those, the, the, the stronger networks. Um, here's another question, uh, a, a very, very different kind of area, which is, you know, um, for people like you who always thought about going and being entrepreneurs, um, you know, you understand that there is an incredible risk of doing this, that, you know, you might do three or four companies, uh, all of which fail before you're successful. And considering that there is this risk and there is a high chance of failure, um, does that affect how a, an, an entrepreneur should consider um, when to go full steam on a business? Should they... You know, should they wait until they've achieved, you know, product market fit before looking for funds and, and building a full-time team or, or should they just get into it and start moving straight away and taking risks straight away? Um, so I think one is depend, it's like, so I think first, so first of all, not, or like there's a lot of timing issues. So if you wait too long, the opportunity might be gone or it might be done by other people. So like, it, you can't possibly think that you're the only one who, who can think about like who, who can think of this and um like my personal view is being an entrepreneur or whatever like having a startup should never be a side hustle i mean just because you're if you're not 100 percent developed to it um how can you possibly make it work because thinking back you know in our first year, all of the founders basically did nothing but, you know, just doing AirWallex. And even that is not like for us, we felt like we didn't have enough time. And, you know, we were very stretched, very thin, and we were doing so many things at the same time. So if you only have half of your time, then it's for me, it's just you might miss the um, timing and you might miss the perfect opportunity to uh, do it to start with but um in terms of product market fit um like i said our first product didn't work and obviously not that there's no market for it i think you know smes definitely need invoicing capabilities but we didn't have the right platform to launch it so for example if we're already a very successful um SaaS platform with you know, millions of SMEs using us, then maybe launching a um, product like that would 
have very good traction um, very quickly, but because we don't have any um, customers, it's going to take us a really, really long time in order for us to have that network effect. Um, and scouting for funds and building a full-time team, again, I think it really depends on the situation you're in. Um, whether you need uh, quite a considerable amount of money to have uh, to build your business to start with, and team-wise, I think you know that in that sense you you can actually be more flexible because you need to hire in advance. So um, yeah. thinking about what you potentially would need in six or twelve months time. Um, will actually determine how quickly you hire. Um, yeah. Um, Lucy, we, have, uh, we, only, we only have time for one more question and um, you know, selfishly, I'm, I'm gonna make it mine. Um, everybody, every, I think every, every entrepreneur out there has at some point in their early career had an interaction with another entrepreneur where that person has said to them uh, like a piece of incredibly wise advice that has just turned out to be uh, true on an ongoing basis and like a guiding star to the way that they continue to operate. What was, what was it for you? What did somebody say to you early when you were starting to build the business that has turned out to be really true and, and which continues to uh, guide the way that you are building um, Airwallex into a global business? So I think this was back um, in early 2016. Um, when we were only thinking about again the invoice right and the and the um, FX side of things and someone actually our entry investor said to me you have to think about the user case what potentially who is going to be using it and you know what exactly where is this product actually going to appear and which is why I think you know we didn't even think we are a payments company back then. We think we are a FX platform. We think we are a, um, you know, tool for SMEs, but it's, it's not big enough. And you actually have to think a lot larger and think about exactly what is the user scenario and, and think from that perspective, how you're going to build the product. And I think that actually works in many cases for many people um, because a lot of people, a lot of founders can get very hung up on a single idea without thinking about the uh, bigger picture. Mm, that is, that is very good. Thank you. I'm glad I got to ask that question. Um, well, before we um, conclude uh, with tonight's event, um, thank you very much for attending. You, uh, Airwallex, and you are offering a, a special deal to anyone who has attended uh, tonight's call, which is a bonus hundred dollars uh, into their air wallets account if they sign up for a virtual air wallets borderless card which i think was recently uh was recently launched uh once your account is approved and you start using the card you'll be able to use the bonus uh hundred dollars immediately i'm gonna ask sarah to put that into the chat now uh for anybody to 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 access it um thank you that's that's very generous thank you uh for um giving us your time this evening and and your advice i know uh, for so many of us, it is uh, really um, a, a pleasure to hear from somebody with so much experience um, now uh, raising in, uh, raising money across multiple series and building one of the most successful tech companies uh, in uh, globally. Um, so thanks very much for your time um, and and best of luck uh, over the over the rest of the year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lucy.